morning. Welcome to Peace for Worship today. We are so glad to have you guys in God's house and a special welcome to our preschool families who are also here today for our Palm Sunday service. Uh, we do have a Palm Processional that's going to be taking place and that will be a mix of our preschoolers and also any other kid who would like to be a part of it. So if you have any kids in the pews who would like to bring up a palm branch with the preschoolers, if they want to head to the back, they can receive a palm branch back there. So I'll give you guys a couple of seconds if anybody wants to go and be a part of the palm procession. All you have to do is be able to walk and carry a palm branch in one hand. That's it. <laughs> All right, while they're doing that, just a couple of other announcements. It is Holy Week. Holy Week officially begins with Palm Sunday, and we get to take a look at Jesus' triumphal ride into Jerusalem, where he would go on to do what we needed more than anything, to come and be our Savior and to rescue us from our sins. And so following on with the rest of the week, on Holy Thursday, we have a service at 6.30. Good Friday, we have a service at 6.30. And then Easter Sunday, are you guys ready? We're going to have a brunch at 9.30. There's going to be an egg hunt for the kids at 10. We have not been able to have that egg hunt outside since I've been here five years, but I was told once upon a time it does happen. So if we get enough sun, maybe the snow will melt and we can have the egg hunt outside. Pray for it, please. We'd love that. Um, so the brunch will be at 9.30. Everybody is invited downstairs, egg hunt at 10, and then we'll, we'll come up here at 10.30 for our worship service. Uh, please come and join us. We would love to have you guys here. We get to celebrate the message of Easter and what it means for us, that Jesus gives us hope. And not like how we use the word hope today, I hope it doesn't snow anymore. I hope it's sunny outside. Hope in Jesus is different because it's anchored in certainty. What he says will happen. And that's what we get to celebrate on Easter. So we'd love to have you guys join us for that. Um, and then we get to our service today. And the theme that we're really going to be focusing in on is the theme of strength. You guys feeling strong today? You guys want to do a push-up competition? I don't really, but some people might like that. That's usually what we think of when, when we hear that word strength, isn't it? It's a feat of strength. You lift something. You go to the gym at Planet Fitness and things go really well. That's what we think of when we hear the word strength. But today, we're going to look at what real strength is, and we're going to see it demonstrated by our Savior Jesus, who comes to rescue us. So that'll be the focus of our service today. Um, if you guys have your worship folders with you, we're going to begin this morning right on page two with the service notes. And then from there, we will continue with the procession of palms. So the, the service flow is a little bit different because of the procession and the preschooler singing. So just a couple of notes. The Sunday before Easter is when Jesus entered Jerusalem on his way to suffer and die. For centuries, the Christian church has used this day both to honor Christ's triumphal entry and to recount the history of Jesus' passion. And today we get to do the same, acclaiming Jesus with palms and praise. And we'll continue then. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you. Dear friends in Christ, today we come together to begin the solemn celebration of Holy Week. Christ entered in triumph into his own city to complete his work as our Messiah, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Let us remember with devotion his entry that culminated at the empty tomb and follow him with a lively faith. United with him by our baptisms, we share in his resurrection and a new life. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And our palm procession will begin.
All right, at this time, any other kids are invited forward for the children's devotion? So I'll give you guys a second to come on up. All right, boys and girls, can you turn around and face me? Can you turn around and face me, sit crisscross applesauce with your hands in your lap. Okay. What do you guys think of this stick that I brought up here today? Pretty cool, huh? This is a walking stick that was made by one of our members here at Peace. His name is Mr. Ron. But today, I'm not going to use it as a walking stick, okay? Today, I'm going to use it as a balancing stick. Have you guys ever tried to balance something on your finger? Have you ever tried to do that before? Should we try it today? Okay, let's try it today. All right. To start with this balancing stick, I'm going to look at the bottom because that's where it is in my hand, okay? And we'll see how it goes. You ready? Here we go. Whoa! Don't want that to happen. I, boys and girls, I don't think I'm focusing on the right thing. That's right, Jack. We don't want to hurt anybody. But I think my focus was in the wrong place. Do you know where you should look when you want to balance something on your hand? You should look all the way at the, at the top. So should we do that? Here we go. Wow. And just like that, I was able to balance this because my eyes were focused just where they needed to be. Now, boys and girls, today is Palm Sunday. You guys got to carry in these palm branches. Raise your hand if you got to carry in a palm branch. Yeah, and you got to put them up here at the altar. Do you know that when Jesus came into Jerusalem that day on a donkey, the people put palm branches on the road and not just palm branches either. They would take their coats and they would lay their coats out and they would put the coats on the road as well with more palm branches just like this. But boys and girls, don't focus on the palm branches and don't focus on the coats. Focus on Jesus. Because Jesus came to Jerusalem. He was riding that donkey because he had a very special job. Do you guys know that Jesus came to be your savior? He came to save you from all of your sins because Jesus had that big job to do. He was riding on that donkey into Jerusalem and one day Jesus would eventually go to the cross and there Jesus would give up his life for you and for me. And so on Palm Sunday, it can be so easy to get lost in the palm branches and in all the coats that people were laying down, but keep your focus on Jesus. During Holy Week, we get to see the heart of God, and it's a heart that is filled with love for each of you. Jesus loves you so much. He came to this world to save you and to rescue you. And so we get to shout out together, Hosanna, can you guys do that with me? Hosanna, which means help us or save us, which is exactly what Jesus did. All right, thank you guys for your time. You can fold your hands, you can bow your heads, and you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for saving me. I love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, during this next part, we're going to sing a couple of hymn verses while you guys go back and find your seats. Does that sound good? Give me two thumbs up if that sounds like a plan. All right, so we'll begin singing that hymn, and you guys can go find your seats.
We'll continue now on page four with a confession of sins and absolution. I would ask you to please stand. O oh God, when we could not come to you because of our lost condition, you came to us in the person of your only Son, Jesus Christ. He humbled himself and became obedient to the cross that we might behold you and again feel your embrace. Father in heaven, hear us now as we confess our sins to you. O oh God, we approach your throne of mercy because we know that we are sinners. We stand accused by your law. Our thoughts have been rebellious and impure, and we have not focused on you. Our words have been unkind and unholy, and we have failed to tell others of your love. Our deeds have been selfish and filled with wrong. We have not served you and others as we ought. Forgive us and help us to live as your people. Friends in Christ, hear the good news. That for your sake, Jesus, the Son of God, came into this world to willingly give his life to pay the price for your sins. Because your king came to Jerusalem to die for you, your sins have been forgiven. Therefore, by the command and in the place of our Lord and King Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for the great and numerous acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path, so may we always worship him as our one true King and follow him with confidence, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today from the Old Testament prophet Zechariah is a very traditional lesson that is used on Palm Sunday because in these words, Zechariah foretells about a coming king who would be humble and victorious and he would come riding on a donkey. Here's what it says. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson for today from Hebrews chapter 12, uh, where Jesus demonstrates his strength by going to the cross for, for us in our place. And as we think about what's coming up on Good Friday, it can be really easy to think about Jesus going there upset or, or maybe frustrated or disappointed but this portion from Hebrews tells us that Jesus went there with joy because he was thinking of you. Here's what it says in verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of our God. We'll continue with our hymn of the day. This is a version from Koine. I would direct your guys' attention to the worship screens in front. Redeemer 
king to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring you are the king of israel and david's royal son now in the lord's name coming our king and blessed one hosanna in the highest that ancient song we sing for christ is our redeemer the lord of heaven our king oh may we ever praise him with heart and life and voice and in his royal presence eternally rejoice That's got to be one of the best hymns out there, right? I love that line in there, just from the first verse. To whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. Um, how awesome it is to have you guys all here today and, and to see your kids and maybe your grandkids and people that you know um, get to come up here and sing praises to Jesus. If your kid starts to sing a couple too many hosannas during the next couple of minutes and you feel like you need to take them out back, we do have a staff nursery directly in the back um, and we have two nursery attendants. You can drop them off there and pick them up anytime you would like. So please know that that's available for you as well. And may the God of all hope fill you with peace and joy as you trust in him. Amen. Edward Stephen Hall. If you had to guess what kind of profession that guy is in, what would you say? An author? A financial advisor? Maybe a, a computer technician? He's kind of got one of those names that sounds like somebody who would work in one of those fields, but that's not actually what Edward Hall does. Truth be told, most people know him as Eddie. And Eddie is a professional strongman. 
I don't know if you guys have ever seen those World Strongman competitions on ESPN, but if you have, chances are you have probably seen Eddie Hall before. Um, in fact, back in 2017, and here's a picture of him, back in 2017, he won the entire thing. And for that year, he was the world's strongest man, which is an incredible feat. But with all the different things that Eddie has accomplished during his career, winning that world championship isn't really the best. No, the the best thing, the greatest achievement that Eddie ever had actually took place one year earlier in 2016 when Eddie successfully deadlifted 500 kilograms. That's 1,000 102 pounds. And to give you guys an idea of an item that you can picture in your head that weighs about that much, 1,102 pounds is a 1959 Mini Cooper. 1,102 pounds is a fully grown polar bear. 1,102 pounds is a concert grand piano. That is an incredible amount of weight to deadlift. And it was an incredible feat, but it gets even better. Every now and then, you guys might come across a story in the news where maybe a mom was able to lift a corner of a vehicle off of her trapped child. Or three buddies were driving in a car and it rolled and started on fire and one of the guys' seatbelts wouldn't unlock. So a guy went over and literally ripped it off of its bolts. You might see that on the news or read a story like that and think to yourself, how is a feat of strength like that even possible? Well, here's your answer. Some body and muscle specialists estimate that the average person can access about 50% of their muscle fibers, while an athlete can access around 70%. But during some fight or flight scenarios, They believe that the human body is capable of accessing 100% of its muscle fiber capabilities. So during Eddie Hall's record-breaking deadlift of 1,102 pounds, he was actually working with a psychiatrist and also a hypnotherapist to actually trick his brain into believing that by accomplishing this lift, he was going to be saving his children from sudden danger. He described it as a very dark place that he didn't ever want to go to again. But when the time came where Eddie stepped up to the barbell, he did it. He struggled a little bit, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of weight. But he did it. He successfully deadlifted 1,102 pounds. You know, when we hear the word strength, that's kind of what we think about, isn't it? It's somebody going to the gym and weights. It's, it's a feat of strength. It's somebody showing off their muscles. And as Christians, as God's children, one of the things that we rejoice in most is knowing that God is almighty. He has all of the power and then some more. And if, if God loves us, and he most certainly does, then he should use that almighty power of his to make a difference in my life, right? This morning, we're really going to be zeroing in on one question in particular, and the question is, what is real strength? And we're going to do so today by jumping into the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. You guys can remain seated for that today, but it's printed on page 7, and it's also going to be available on the screens if you would like to follow along. But here's what Mark records. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, 
what are you doing untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is the gospel of our Savior. Jesus had done this before. He had gone into Jerusalem dozens and dozens of times, and and fairly often we find record of him spending some time in one of those two towns that was listed, those two towns, Bethany and Bethphage. Maybe the town of Bethany rang a bell in your heads because that was actually the hometown of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But both of those two towns, they were situated just outside of Jerusalem, maybe two or three miles. And so for the most part, when Jesus would go into Jerusalem, he would always walk those last couple of miles. They were kind of downhill, which made it really nice. But this time, Jesus decided that he needed a ride. Because he knew that this time, when he went into Jerusalem, it was going to be different. So he sent some of his disciples to go and, and get a colt, the colt of a, of a donkey, And they bring it back to Jesus. And again, he's made this trek numerous times. He doesn't need this ride because he's tired and exhausted or because he has bad arch support in his sandals. It actually happened just like this because that's exactly how the Bible said it would happen. 500 years earlier, before Jesus was ever born into this world, God used a prophet named Zechariah to say this Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. All right, Zechariah, you know, thanks for that verse. I guess, you know, it's God's word, so we've got to take it as it is. But, but I still wonder, why a donkey? Don't you guys ever wonder that? I mean, Jesus is the Son of God and the King of Kings. I want to see him ride into Jerusalem on a lion. Or maybe an elephant. Or maybe one of those white horses, like the one Gandalf rode in Lord of the Rings. Because that'd be a display of power, wouldn't it? That would be a a display of strength. One, One of the best answers to that question we get from looking at other parts of the Old Testament, specifically parts that talk about Israelite leaders and kings. Do you guys know what the great King David would often ride when he traveled from place to place? He'd ride a donkey. And when King Solomon was crowned king of Israel and his coronation spilled into the streets of Jerusalem, do you know what he was riding when he was touring the streets of Jerusalem? A donkey. Donkeys were were kind of, for lack of a a better metaphor, they were the first century Air Force One. That is what kings would ride. They would ride donkeys. But as good of an answer as that is, I, I think there's even one that's maybe a little bit better. And it's thinking about how that donkey fit Jesus's purpose so well. He was coming as a king. But he was coming in humility. He was coming to begin his reign. But he wasn't going to lord it over people. Jesus came as the strength of God himself. And so he chose to ride a donkey. So the disciples, they go off and And they find this donkey in what must have been an absolutely hilarious exchange with the animal's owners. They go up and find it. Yeah, we're going to take this donkey. Um, Sirs, you don't own that donkey. Um, It's okay. The Lord needs it. All right, that works. Go ahead, take it and bring it back. So they go and they bring this donkey to Jesus. They put some cloaks on it. Jesus mounts this donkey and he begins his kingly ride. 
And as he does so, the streets of Jerusalem begin to swell. They're packed. Main Street on Jerusalem is packed with crowds and crowds of people because they, they understood that something was happening, something different. And I think God, the Holy Spirit, had to open their eyes to see that that prophecy from Zechariah was being fulfilled right before their very eyes. And so they gather there, and, and they start to lay their coats down on the ground, and they start to lay palm branches on the path. And this crowd of people, they unite their voices together and they say, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hopefully today you guys are realizing how all of these Palm Sunday things are way more connected than you maybe even realized because the whole Bible is really connected, Old and New Testament alike, we, we see that even more in what the people were saying together. You know, it wasn't like Jesus was riding down the street on the donkey and some guy was like, hey, what should we shout to this guy riding on the donkey? And, and then someone turned and said, well, what about Hosanna? And they were all like, yeah, that's good. We should shout Hosanna. Hosanna is actually a Hebrew word. It means help, please or save, please. And it really takes us back to one psalm in particular, Psalm 118. This morning, I actually want to read a couple of verses from it for you guys, because it ties together so well with what is happening on Palm Sunday. So it's up there on the screen, but here's what it says, starting at verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. When you guys heard those verses, who popped into your heads? Jesus, right? The stone the builders rejected? That's Jesus. And then we go on to learn that in Jesus' day, the rabbis were teaching that when the Messiah would finally make his entrance into Jerusalem, the people were to greet him with a song, with a psalm. Can you guys guess what psalm they were supposed to use? Psalm 118. The words from this psalm were reserved exclusively for the one true promised Messiah. I was having a conversation with a pastor a couple weeks ago and he said that he had a member come up to him out of the blue one day and say, Pastor, I don't think we spent enough time praising God. And he wasn't talking about Sunday church either. He's talking about in our lives as Christians how we don't really spend enough time praising God not just for what he's done but for who he is. I think he's right. Wouldn't you agree? That, that question's been on my mind a lot lately, and, and so I'm going to speak for myself here right now, but why don't I, Matthew Praver, spend more time praising God? I think in my sinful heart, I, I feel like God first needs to give me a reason to praise him. And I think that, yeah, God needs to go on and do something that is praiseworthy and, and he needs to use that strength of his to finally make an impact in my life, a difference in my life. And if he drops down a 1,102 pound bag of cash on my doorstep, then I'll praise him. And if he gives me 1,102 days of straight, uninterrupted good health, after having gone through every cold virus and flu during this winter season, then I'll praise him. And if God gives me 1,102 new friends so that I don't have to struggle with feelings of loneliness from time to time, then I'll praise him. Are you guys like me? I sincerely hope not, but I bet you are. 
And, and I bet you struggle just as much as I do with the thought that God should use all of that strength of his to bless me. He should exert that strength that he has to make my life better. And where I think this ultimately ends up is that, that we wrongfully, and, and let's call it what it is, we, we sinfully view Jesus just as a means to get something else. And so we don't go to Jesus for Jesus. We, we go to Jesus for what we hope he can give us. And for the most part, it ends up being something temporary and fleeting and earthly. That crowd of people that was gathered that day, they didn't ask Jesus for anything. Did you notice that? There were no shouts of, heal us, Jesus, or, or multiply that fish again like you did that one time, or, or can we get some more sunshine in the forecast? There was none of that. The people praised God for being God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, Jesus' ride, it, it might not have seemed like one that was marked with divine strength, but that's exactly what it was. Because Jesus was going on in humility and in strength to do what only he could do, and that is to win your salvation and mine. I'm not sure if you guys know anything about the geography of where this was happening. I'd mentioned a little bit before how this is kind of going downhill, this street into Jerusalem. From, from that vantage point on this donkey, I, I think Jesus could see a whole lot. I think he could see the Garden of Gethsemane where he was soon going to be dropping droplets of blood as he was praying to his Father in heaven. I think he could see the, the high priest's house where he was going to be put on trial. I think he could see Pilate's fortress where he was eventually going to be condemned to death. And maybe, just maybe, he was able to see this hill just outside of the city that looked a little bit like a skull. And he still rode on. Because there is something different about this king. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This wasn't about some kind of display of strength where Jesus was going to bench press three donkeys. This was about Jesus showing you the strength of his love. He could have turned that donkey around, but, but he didn't. Because he loves you. You are the means to the end for him. I don't know if you guys can see it. You are the, the final goal. The, the culmination of, of why he was there. The, the reason that he appeared in this world and everything that he did, the, the donkey, the trial, the cross. He did it so he could make you his own. And that's how God used his strength. He stared in the face of death knowing exactly what he had to do and, and he went there and, and he accomplished our salvation so he could make you his very own sons and daughters. You're part of God's family now. That's not maybe what our world thinks of when they hear the word strength. But that's real strength. Jesus goes for you and me. Oh, the ending to the Eddie Hall story. So right after he, uh, he accomplished this record-breaking deadlift of 1,102 pounds, he was not in the greatest of shape physically. Uh, he was fading in and out of consciousness for the next, like, 10 minutes. It took five hours for his heart rate to get back down where it needed to be. Um, he had blood coming out of his nose and in his ears, and maybe worst of all, he had a birthday party for his son the next day and he couldn't remember the faces of his family. Like, can you imagine how awkward that was? Happy birthday to one of you. Like, he, he was not in a good place and eventually he recovered. Okay, he recovered, he's doing great. 
But when the day comes where Eddie Hall turns 75 years of age, do you think he'll be able to accomplish that feat of strength again? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Our strength, it just doesn't last. But Jesus' does. We expend so much energy every single day and we use up all the strength that we have. Jesus' strength is everlasting. And his promise is that he will use his strength not to win the next World Strongman competition. He, he will use his strength in your lives to bless you and to benefit you and to continue showing you his love. We see real strength with Jesus. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue now on page 8 with our confession of faith. This is the Apostles' Creed, something that Christians have been confessing together for almost 1,800 years now. And so we do split it up into three parts because this is one of those things in church where it can be so easy to just get into a rhythm. I've said this 1,000 times and I just speak it and I don't really think about what it means. So one of the things that we like to do here is break it up a little bit and ask some thought-provoking questions to get you to think about more why am I saying this and what does it mean? So we're going to do that together with one voice. I'll start with a little question at the beginning and then you guys are invited to join in for the bolded portions. Living in a world where people believe that the universe was formed through chance or accident, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Living in a world where people are confronted with the guilt and punishment of sin, what do you believe Jesus did for you? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Living in a world where people are without hope and certainty, what do you believe? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, during this next part, we collect our offering, uh, but we do so by leaving a basket outside the doors. Um, and if you are a guest here today, please do not feel obligated to contribute. We are glad that we could have you here to share the good news of Jesus with you, and we hope that you come back. Um, there is a QR code on the first page. If you'd like to, to leave, leave a note telling us what you thought about the service or how we can continue to serve you with the gospel, we would love to hear your guys' feedback. Um, all right, so moving on now. This next part is also where we have a meet and greet portion that we kind of embed in the middle of the service just to get the blood flowing a little bit more. And the hope being that the conversations you start here can continue out there while we share in some snacks. So we do have one minute and 30 seconds that we will put on the board. And as the music begins and we get towards 10 or 15 seconds, if you guys can find your seats again, um, please do so. And we'll continue with the prayer of the church up at front. So we'll begin. Please stand up, meet and greet one another.
If you could and are willing, uh, please go back and find your seats. We will continue in just a moment with the prayer of the church. This morning during our prayer of the church, we're going to offer up three intercessory prayers. Um, one of them is going to be for Deanna, the mother of Chelsea Garneau. She had a minor stroke uh, recently, but she's recovering well. Um, and so we're going to ask God to continue blessing her with recovery. Uh, we're also going to be offering up prayers on behalf of Sharon and David Welch. Um, their friend Sonia, who we prayed for about six weeks ago, did pass away. Um, and also we're going to be praying for Patty, who is Terry's friend. Um, we're going to ask God to give those people comfort during this time of grief and to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, who promises incredible things. One of those things being a resurrection from the dead and eternal life with him. So we'll go to our God very boldly. I would ask you to please stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the king of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, you humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a life of perfect conformity to God's holy law in our place. Praise be to you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross, to redeem us from sin. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Help us to proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to all people of all nations. Use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the businesses and industries of our land. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded. Cause all employees to be diligent and faithful. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your abiding care and strengthen the faith of the dying. O oh Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on Deanna during her illness. If it's your will, we ask that you spare her and restore her back to full strength. God, you gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses, and so we ask that you deal compassionately with Deanna and bless the medical means employed on her behalf with your healing power. We commit her to your gracious mercy and protection, for you are a faithful and a merciful God. O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you have blessed our fellow believers, Patty and Sonia, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought them to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would comfort their families and all who mourn their deaths with your precious promises. Cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful salvation. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn.
Once again, good morning and thank you for joining us. Preschool families, thank you so much for being here. We love having you guys here and we love hearing your kids sing praises to Jesus. So can we give the preschoolers a round of applause for singing? That was awesome. Just a couple more brief announcements. On the last page of the bulletin at the bottom, there's a schedule for our Holy Week worship services. So if you are somebody who would really love to have a piece of paper that you can put up on the refrigerator, please feel free to use that. And then lastly, um, after people start to head out a little bit, probably we'll give it 30 minutes or so, we are going to be hitting the streets and handing out some Easter invites. If you are able and willing to stay and help, we would love to have some help. We're going to try and hit one of the neighborhood subdivisions to the left over there that isn't super hilly um, because we haven't had enough time to work on cardio yet, maybe in the summertime. But if you're able and willing to stay and help, that would be wonderful. Please stay. There's plenty of treats and snacks there. Um, help yourself. Continue those conversations that you guys started earlier in the service. And I pray that God be with you and bless you this week. Our usher will usher you out.